It was October 1992. I had just turned 22 years old. And I had also just signed a seven album deal with Atlantic Records. And I was living at home with my mom and dad who were so proud of me that it was almost unbearable. <laughs> um, so I'm from Ipswich, Massachusetts, which is about an hour north of Boston. And my dad uh, was a middle school teacher there for forever. And everybody knew my dad. His name's John and, uh, and my mom, really popular family and really great people. And my dad was downtown one day getting a coffee. And this guy who um, teaches over at Endicott College, which is in Beverly, about a half hour away. There you go. Uh, was, he's a friend of my dad's. He was like, oh, you know, hey, John, good to see you. He's like, hey, what's going on? Oh, I hear a lot about your kid these days. My dad's like, yep, you do. And, uh, and this guy's like, you know, um, Bob Dylan's on his 30th anniversary tour, and we've got him coming to Endicott College to play uh, right here in Beverly. Do you think Melissa would want to open up that show? And my father says without a beat, absolutely. Now, I'm not there, okay? So he's now my agent. So uh, he says, absolutely. And then the, the promoter guy from Endicott goes, that's great, but listen, there's one hitch. Uh, and that is this, that um, I've been informed by Dylan's people that no one, and they mean no one, opens for Bob Dylan solo. So she has to find a band. And my dad goes, no problem. He comes home, he's crying. You're not gonna believe it, Andy. You're not gonna believe it. My mother's, what's going on, John? He says, I got Melissa the gig. I got her a gig opening for Bob Dylan. My mother starts crying. They're hugging each other. They had tickets to Woodstock, but they didn't make it. So like, this was like the dream. Now I'm like the golden child. My sister's like, whatever. So I'm standing there. I'm like, you're talking about me. I'm right here. What's going on? So dad goes, um, I got you the gig. You're gonna open. It's the Endicott College show, it's his 30th anniversary, it's going to be great, but the only thing is, kids, you got to find a band. And I was like, oh, awesome. I, I have never played live with a band before, ever. I'm only 22, but mind you, I thought I had been playing for a long time. So, um, so I called up my alma mater, Berklee College of Music. I found a couple musicians. We rehearsed for like five days. We got about five or six songs down. We felt like we were ready to go. Boom. Day of the show, October 30th, 1992. I'm opening for Bob Dylan. Me and my mom leave from Ipswich, head to Beverly. Dad comes from the middle school. The band comes up from Boston. We meet. We're at the tent. It's freezing out. There's 4,000 people lined up outside the tent, and you can hear Dylan's band sound checking. And I'm walking in. We walk through the tent, and I see him. Bob Dylan, there he is. He's walking right towards me, and he's got a zipped-up hoodie on and a hood over, and I'm thinking, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? And he keeps walking towards me, and I still don't have it. And I'm going, and then I just walk by him, and I go, hey. <laughs> and he went, but I didn't get a hey out of him. So we get into the dressing room. I'm all excited, and the dressing room is full-on five-star. It has everything, every kind of coffee, every kind of tea, the deli platter, like important cheese, like brie. And so it's very exciting for us. So we're sitting there, we're very excited to play. And the dude that got me the gig, the dude from uh, Endicott comes in and he goes, John, can I talk to you for a second? And now my stomach drops because I'm like, I know there's something wrong. So my dad goes outside, talks to the guy for like two seconds, comes back and he goes, I got really bad news. But Dylan, he's, he's canceled the show. I mean, like, Elvis has left the building. He actually said that. I didn't just make that part up. Elvis says, the show can't happen. It's not going on. And I was like, what are you talking about? Why? My father says, well, we've been informed that Dylan has a stipulation in his contract that it has to be at least 68 degrees in the venue for him to perform. And now, I will grant him this, it was very cold that night, maybe 58, you know, 62, but still, I was like, come on, you know, but he didn't want to play. So in the very moment that we all realized we weren't going to get to play this gig, we also realized that we were the only five people that knew this and that the 4,000 people didn't know this yet, and we needed to get out of there, like, right away. So me and my mom look at each other, and it was like this instant mother-daughter thing, and we start packing up the back of her rabbit with everything from that dressing room, and I mean everything. The <laughs> the deli platter, the cups, right? The Coke, the bubbly water, the coffee, the coffee filters, the little honey bear, the little tiny packets of mayonnaise, the little tiny packets of mustard we're throwing. She's like, get it in the car, get it in the car. And we leave and we go back to Ipswich. The band drives back to Boston. My father's like rummaging around drinking more coffee than he should. And when we get inside the house, me and my mom, we walk in and the phone is ringing and we're like, that's weird. I put the deli platter down. I answer the phone and it's my dad and he's screaming, the show the show's back on! The show's back on! I'm not even joking. I'm not even making this up. The show's back on. Get back in the car. Get over here. So I hang up the phone. I'm screaming at my mother. We gotta go back. She's like, what are you talking about? We get in the car. 15 minutes 
sits flat. My mom, driving a rabbit like 75 miles an hour down Route 1A, pulls behind the tent, and I get out of the passenger car, and I'm like right by the side door of where you go onto the stage, and the promoter's standing there, and he's yelling at me, get on the stage, get on the stage. There's no time for the band. I remember, he's like, there's no time for the band. There's no time for the band. And I was like, good thing, man, because the band already left. <laughs> so I walk on the stage, I've got my guitar, and all the lights are on. I can feel the heat on the back of my head, because they're trying to warm this tent up for Dylan. So all the lights, there's 4,000 people. I can see every single one of them. And in the back row, they start crowd surfing this guy. And then I notice that there's a stretcher being wheeled down with the EMT people. And I'm up playing my folk song. And I'm like, what's going on? Everything OK? And they're like, yeah, everything's fine. They put the dude on the gurney, and they wheel him back out. I finished playing this. So I was like, whatever. I walk off the stage. I don't even know. I think I played three songs. And there was a guy at the bottom of the stairs. And he looked at me, and he goes, great job, kid. And I was like, thanks. Do you work here? Or he goes, no, I'm Ian. I'm Dylan's drummer. And I was like, Oh, cool. So two years later, I'm in Glastonbury, England, playing the Glastonbury Festival, touring that album I had moved to California to make. And that year at Glastonbury, headlining was The Pretenders, Radiohead, and Jackson Brown. This was not a bad gig to get. And I played that gig, and all the lights were dimmed. And I played a full set. I did an awesome job. No one had a heart attack <laughs> that I know of. No stretcher got rolled into the front. I finished that set, and I walked off the stage, and there was a guy standing there. And it was Ian Wallace. He also played dramas for Jackson Brown. And he looked at me, and he said, I remember you. You're the one who got to open for Bob Dylan solo.